Good morning, Rygate Baptist Church. It's great, well, not to see you, because you can see me, I can't see you, but I still know that you're there, and I, I know that you're all as good-looking as you were before we left being in this place, so uh, I'm pleased to be able to say that. I'm sure it hasn't changed that much in a few weeks. It's really good to see you. Uh, I'm going to move straight in today, uh, because there's quite a lot in this, and I want to try and keep it shorter if I can. I say shorter, uh, below the minutes I did last week at least. And uh, so I'm going to go on. But before I start, I want to share a testimony. And it's a testimony from Debs Kefford. And she's one of our many people in our, our church that are in the hospital and on the front line. And she was saying that the worship group had been doing uh, daily devotionals together. And that Susie Bailey uh, had this real revelation that the power of the name of Jesus uh, is so powerful. And she was feeling unwell. And Susie prayed the name of Jesus, and she, she started to feel better. And Debs Keffer was in the hospital, and she started to feel her chest tightening and her breathing uh, really getting worse, and she'd been coughing in the day. And she started to think, I think I've got COVID-19. My manager's got it, and he's now in hospital, uh, not working, but in hospital. And three of my colleagues have got it, and now I'm getting it. And she had this memory of what Susie has said about the power in the name of Jesus. So she decided to just start speaking the name of Jesus over herself. And it went away instantly. Isn't that amazing? That's the power. Why is it amazing? It should be the everyday. But that's what we're talking about. In a time when we are seeing so much catastrophe, Jesus is the name above every other name and can change everything. So thank you so much, Debs. And Keep everyone, like the Jeffersons and the Venuses and the Elliot Ashleys and, and, and Katie Labour and Debs and anyone else that I've not mentioned, Magda, there's loads of them that all work in the hospital or around the hospital or even uh, people that are on the front line in any way. Keep them in your prayers and encourage them. Send them little encouragements. So as you all know, today we are starting the David series. And so we're going to be looking at the series. It won't just be about David. It'll be about the life of David as well. So there'll be things like today we'll be looking at Samuel quite a bit. So it's really letting the text speak rather than us just saying, well, let's just look at David and apply loads of things to it. We need to look at what's going on. So if you want to turn to 1 Samuel 16 verses 1 to 13, we will get straight on with a talk in trusting in God, it's called. So jump straight in to 1 Samuel 16 1 to 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the, of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sac sacrifice to the Lord consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at thing, the things people look at, People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadad and had him pass before Samuel. And Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse had Shema pass by him. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are there these all your sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. 
He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramach. Lord, we pray that you'll speak this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. I want to get a bit of context before we start. So, we've got to think about Israel and where they're at. Israel had been led by God out of Egypt, rescued, he'd provided for them, they'd been rescued through the waters of the Red Sea, up onto the Promised Land. He'd provided food for them, he'd taken care of them, and he'd basically showed his faithfulness in everything. I hope you see God's faithfulness in your life because he is faithful to us all, all of the time. Uh, yet in 1 Samuel 8, there is something that changes. The Israelites decide they don't want him. And they decide they don't want Samuel. Samuel's too old and his sons are too wayward and, and, and they don't want God. They just want a king like all the other nations have. They want a king. They don't want God. They want someone that they can see. So God gives them Saul. And in all of this, Samuel is really hurt. He's really upset because they've rejected him and his sons. And God says to Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. They've rejected God. So I'll give them Saul. So he brings out Saul and gives this man who was hiding away, he brings him out, and he's, he's a head taller, we're told, than anyone else. He's a big man. And we're told that he's strong and he's handsome, and, and he's more handsome than anyone else, or at least as handsome as anyone else in Israel. I know how he feels uh, in this church. <laughs> Just kidding. And, um, so he has this sort of charisma. You're thinking, this is exactly who you would choose, isn't it? You know, in this day and age, you'd say, I'll take the taller, stronger, better looking guy for sure. This is the right man. And you know, Saul starts his ministry, his kingship, humbly and, and victoriously, and he wins the people over. But then he starts to deteriorate. And what we find with Saul is that he makes rash decisions, and he endangers the army, and he endangers his son, to the point where he says the army cannot eat anything when they're at battle, in this particular battle with the Amalekites. And so afterwards, Jonathan goes into, into the forest, and he sees this honey, and he eats it. And this is Saul's son. And then someone tells him, well, your dad said we're not allowed. So when Saul finds out, he's like, well, my son's going to have to die. And the people say, no, he saved us. You can't touch a hair on his head. So he lives. But you can see the type of man Saul is. He makes rash decisions, and he goes out and nearly wipes out the army by sending them to battle without any food. And he also goes to kill his own son. But the worst thing is that he disobeys the Lord's instruction to kill everything when he goes to battle with the Amalekites. He disobeys his instruction. There's this most humorous moment in the Bible, I love it, where he says to Samuel, Saul says, I, I, I've done everything God asked. I've done it all. I've killed them all. I've, I've wiped these, these people out. And then Samuel says to him, so what's that bleating I can hear in my ears? And it's all the sheep going, meh, meh. And there's Saul's obviously standing there going, oops. And he says this, and this is what God tells him to say to him. For rebellion is like sin of divination. And arrogance like the evil of idolatry. And because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. What do we see here? We see here that it says that divination and rebellion are the same thing. It's like, you know, when you go out and you look for spiritualism, for instance, and you go and do things like that, you're rebelling against God. And when you rebel against God, you are welcoming in the foothold of Satan in your life. And if you open up too much, you are welcoming Satan to come and his demons to come and ravish your life. And then it says also that arrogance is the evil of idolatry. Well, idolatry is, is basically idolizing yourself above God. It means you, you choose things of this world above God. And when you do that, you're putting yourself above God because you're saying, I'm God of my world. I will choose. And it says that is evil. And it says that that arrogance, that, that you above God is idolatry. And he says to Saul, because of this, and because you disobeyed my word, I'm rejecting you as king. There's two questions I want to ask you to start with today. The first is, how many of you make decisions in your life based on the outward appearance of something or someone? How many of you do that? It might be dating someone is the obvious one, isn't it? 
I mean, have you ever dated someone in your life that is handsome or pretty? I've done it, believe it or not. Uh, of course, my wife I did, but this, pl this point doesn't apply, apply to her because she's perfect for me. But have you ever dated someone that looks so good on the outside and so pretty and so handsome that you won't listen to the truth behind their character? That you get to know them more and they're just awful, they're dog awful, and uh, they're not good for you and they treat you bad, but because you fancy them, you just can't hear any of the truth. Have you ever made decisions in your life based on what something looks like and something you desire rather than what it really is? And the second question I want to ask you is, how many of you have rejected God's word in your life? How many of you have said, my way is better than God's way? How many of you are doing that now? I wonder, and I wonder how that is working out for you. Because one of the things that I've worked out in my life is when you choose your way over God's ways, it always ends in disappointment. I've said to many people over the years, they've sat in front of me and said, oh, well, you know, I'm in love with this person now and I'm going to go and be with that person. And I'm like, but you're married. Yeah, but I feel that God has said it's okay. No, he hasn't. It says in here that it isn't okay. He hasn't changed. It's the same yesterday, today, as he is tomorrow. I tell you what you've got. You've got skirt syndrome. You've seen a little bit of skirt that you fancy, because you've been with your wife a long time, and let's be honest, when we've been with someone a long time, um, things become a bit normal in some way or other, and you've seen something new, it's caught your heart, and you want to go with it. And I've said to these people in the past, you will come back to me one day, and you will say it didn't work out. I had a, an email not so long ago just saying, Mike, I just want you to know that you were right. That happened to me, and I was wrong, and now I miss the person I should be with. Disappointment, because he chose his way. If we reject God's word, it will end in disappointment. And this is what we get to here. And it's the first thing I want us to look at is disappointment. Because we start with disappointment in Samuel. Samuel is mourning. And he's, he's mourning because Saul is, is no longer going to be king. And God has rejected him as king. And he's just disappointed. He's living in disappointment and he's mourning. And God says, how long are you going to mourn for? In other words, what's happened is Samuel is not only mourning and disappointed, he is useless. He's not going anywhere. He, he's not going forward in his life. He's not, he's not going in the direction God wants him to. One of the greatest causes of ineffectiveness in a Christian life is disappointment. One of the greatest causes of derailing the faith of a Christian is disappointment. Think about it. God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. What he was saying is, I've got work for you to do. I don't want you looking back at Moses. He's dead. He's gone. It's time to go. He said to Elijah, you know, get over yourself, basically. These are my words, not God's. He said, get over yourself. You think you're the only prophet left? I've got 7,000. You get on with your job. Get up. Move on. It's so important that what we see in those two people is disappointment. And what we see in Samuel is disappointment. And I wonder if you face disappointment. I wonder if you're disappointed today in life in general, in God. Where does disappointment come from? Well, disappointment will be faced by everyone. There's no one reason for disappointment. We all will face disappointment. But here's something I want to share with you today. It all goes back to Israel's rejection of God in favour of a king. It all starts there. That's where disappointment stems from. It's when we reject God over something else. We want a king rather than God. We want someone we can see, someone we can touch. Because Israel wanted a king, and they wanted to be like all the other nations. And they wanted every other to say, we're just like you. But what did those other nations have? They had sin that led to death. And they had sin that led to all the things going wrong. They had uh, uh, false gods and they had demonic influences and sacrifice of children. And they had kings that really didn't love them in any way, shape or form. And it just went wrong for them. But Israel was saying, we want to be like them. We want a king that we can see. In other words, God, I don't want you. And what does it say in Romans 1? Well, when we reject God, he says, I give you over to what is your worst enemy in the whole wide world. And that enemy is yourself. Because you are very good at destroying yourself. I give you over to it. It's the greatest punishment I can ever give you. I've said it before. i say it again. He gives us over to ourselves because we destroy ourselves. Disappointment stems from living my way rather than thy way. Because my way says I can cut corners. My way says I can do what I want and I don't have to answer to anybody. My way says I can have whatever I want even if it's not good for me. 
My way is the best way, not thy way. But there is a proverb, and it's Proverbs 14, 12. And it says this, There is a way that appears right, but in the end it leads to death. Let me repeat that. There is a way that appears right, but in the end it leads to death. Have you ever looked back at your decisions when you've chosen to do things without God? And have you seen the fruit that comes from them? And whether it's lasting fruit or whether it's rotten fruit, and whether it rots quickly or rots long, you will find disappointment when there's no God in your decision. There is a parable, uh, well, it's not a parable, I don't believe it's a parable, there's a story in the Bible that some people say is a parable. And it's the parable, they say, of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, the reason I don't believe it's a parable is because it's the only parable in the Bible that uses real names. I believe this is a real story that Jesus wanted to share. And what it is, it is a story of, of a rich man who has a beggar at his gate. And every day he walks past that beggar and gives him no food and didn't take care of him. And then one day the rich man dies. And he dies and he's in Hades, which is like the temporal place of hell. And so he's in this temporal place until hell is, is available to him, which is not a great thing to look forward to. Um, and there's this chasm. And on the far side of the chasm he sees Abraham. And he sees Lazarus, this poor man. And Lazarus is in a good place and now he is in a bad place. And he calls out and says, Abraham, you know, can you send Lazarus to, to, to just dip his finger in the water and put it on my tongue so I don't feel this bad and, and it's agony here. And he says, no, it's too late. You treated him bad then, you're treating him bad now and you just haven't learned. He says, let me go and tell my brothers so they don't end up here. He says, even if someone comes back from the dead, are they going to listen? And he was pointing to Jesus because Jesus was going to come back from the dead and people wouldn't listen. But here's the point. The rich man spent his life doing his way. He spent his life feeding himself and making sure everything in his life was round him. And it ended in the place of death. Lazarus, however, had an eye and a heart for God. And therefore, it ended in the place of beauty and purity and, and just a wonderful place, which is like a temporal, heavenly paradise. Choosing your way will always end in disappointment because ultimately our way can never lead us into heaven. Have you ever talked to a wayward Christian? I've talked to many over the years where they've gone away from church and they always say to me, well, do you know what, Mike? I just come to realize that you guys take it too seriously, too literally. Take God's word too literally. You just need to lighten up. You know, you ever heard that? It's just like, oh, now I'm having the time of my life. You know, I get to go out and drink more. And I get to go out with my friends. I get to lay in on a Sunday morning. Life is so good. But when you get to the bottom of it, there's still disappointment there. There's still problems in their life. And we see it with Saul. Saul lightened up. He was told by God, you must kill everything and everyone in that, 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 that nation of the Amalekites. You must kill them all. He said, because they are wicked and it will spread. Kill them all. And he kept just a few things, including some sheep, and, and he kept a king alive that he shouldn't have kept alive. And he, he, he decided to lighten up. And do you think that God responded by saying, oh, do you know what, Saul? I'm so glad I've got your wisdom. I'm so glad you know what's going on in the world and that you are the one that I should trust. Do you think that's what God said? He said, no. He says, I'm rejecting you as king because you rejected my word over your life. You rejected me as God and king over your life, so I'm rejecting you as king. You see, what the proverb is saying is your way might appear to be good, but it will end in disappointment and it will end in death. And the thing I want to say to you today is, have you rejected God in your life? Have you rejected his word over your life? And are you walking in a different way? Are you starting to head out the door rather than head firmly into God's presence? It says here, the proverb is clear, that it may seem like the right way. It may seem good to you, but it will end in death and disappointment. So how do we, how does God deal with disappointment? How does he deal with it? Well, let's see what he says to Samuel. He says simply this, it's time to move on. He says, I now know my king. I know who he is. Get your horn, get your oil. We're going to go and we're going to anoint the future king. It's David. He doesn't know at that stage, but God does. And he's basically taking him to the king that would be the king that points to Jesus. He's the foreshadow of Jesus. This is an exciting moment for God. 
Samuel, on the other hand, has to obey him. He says, time to move on. If you want to get out of disappointment, you have to get up and you have to follow God even in your disappointment. You have to decide that you are going to follow through with the Lord no matter what. Because the answer to the overcoming disappointment is to trust God in faith and to keep on going with God. There is no other way. Every other way will lead to disappointment. Many years ago, my parents split up. I was two and a half, and my life was, I was young, I, I didn't understand it fully, but as I got a little bit older, you know, sort of three, four, five, uh, my sister and I would go to my, uh, my, my nan's house every two weeks, and we'd see my dad there. But often in the day, my dad would be at work and, or playing football, so we would be there in my nan's house, pretty much with my nan downstairs and us alone upstairs. And my sister and I used to pray that our parents would get back together. We wanted them back together. It wasn't what we wanted. We wanted our mum and dad together. We wanted a home. And you know what? It didn't work out that way. And it's never God's plan for divorce. But what I can do say is that he works all things for the good of those that love him. Okay? And so even though we prayed and it didn't happen, we could have sat for the rest of our life in bitterness and said, oh, why is this not happening? And we had a bad childhood and this didn't happen. We had to move on. Otherwise, we would live out our life in light of that disappointment. We had to move on. We had to just keep going. And you know what? Even though it wasn't God's initial plan for us, he used what wasn't working right in our lives to still bless us and to bring us to this point. I I'm here preaching today. It's a wonderful privilege because God has still managed to bring his plan into being, even though along the way there's been some bumps. And he's used even those bumps to bless us at times. We've had uh, extra parents and stuff. And I'm not saying it's the right way to go, but it, rather than give up and live in disappointment, we've managed to make good of the situation because God is faithful. But if we'd stayed where we were, and if we hadn't been willing to move forward in life, we would still be brokenhearted and bitter and going nowhere in disappointment. You know, in 1982, there was a woman called Melody, uh, Melody Green. She was married to a man called Keith Green incredible artist, uh, particularly Keith, he was an incredible singer and evangelist. And she got a call to say, your husband, 28, uh, has been in a plane crash with your two children, and they're all dead. They're all dead. How disappointed do you think she was? How sad do you think she was? Well, here's the thing. What do you think she was doing a year later? She was continuing his ministry and saving souls. She didn't allow her disappointment to cripple the rest of her life. She trusted in God, she continued with the mission of God, and she kept on going, and people got saved. She had the most incredible catastrophe you'll ever know. And she kept going for God. You'll never be certain about what God has in store for your life. You'll never ever know what's coming around the corner. But you can trust him and you can keep going even when you are disappointed and you can find at the end of it, you will find his promises. You know, there's a preacher in America called Paul Washer and he tells a story uh, about a pastor that comes into church one day and he notices that the man that comes to church that is usually absolutely miserable in his church seems happy. He's like, this is a miracle. I need to find out what it is. So he says, so um, you're usually quite miserable. So why are you happy? I need to do that more often in this church. Why are you, why are you smiling? You're usually miserable. And uh, so he asked him, and the guy said, well, I had a dream last night. I had a dream that my wife that left me came back to me. And now I'm excited. And Paul says, do you know what? That dream might come true, and that's great. But it's a vain hope. It, 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 it may not be of God, it may be. It's a vain hope. If it doesn't come to fruition, then you'll be disappointed. And he says, the people that live through disappointment and continue to move on are the people that come to know God and his character and rely on that in all situations. I can tell you that God has been good in my life. He's unchanging. There have been ups, there have been downs, but he has always been stably faithful in my life and brought me through. When there's been a disappointment, I've just gone, oh, I'm disappointed, but still, I'm going to keep going for God. I felt down at times, but I kept going because we can trust in the character of God. Samuel got stuck in the past. He was mourning over Saul. God said, it's time to move on. 
God wants us to remember his faithfulness. God wants to remember all the good things that he has done in our lives. But he doesn't want us to romanticise and to live in the past. He doesn't want, if you've been in the past and you've been in a church that's just wonderful, you don't like this one, but you just have to come. Don't romanticise in the past one. Get on with trying to live out what God's doing in this one. If you live through the outpouring, uh, the great Holy Spirit outpouring in the past, if you keep looking back at that, how are you ever going to receive something in the future? If you're always going, it was so good back then. Oh, I wish we could have those days back. God doesn't bring the days back. He takes you to a new day and a new future and a great time. He wants to pour his spirit now, especially now when the world is seeing what the Bible has promised, that the world's wills will come off and then they will know that they need God. Don't look back romanticizing. I don't know about you, but uh, years ago, uh, I used to hop from one woman to another, which is uh, surprising, I know, looking at this face. But I remember what used to happen. I used to always go backwards. And the reason I used to go backwards, even though I left someone, I would go a year down the line knowing I made the right decision, two years down the line thinking, actually, they weren't that bad. And then three years down the line, actually, they were brilliant. No, it's because we romanticize and we lie and we forget all the bad things and we start thinking about the good and think, I want to go back there. God doesn't want us looking backwards. He wants us to look at the wonderful things he's got in the future. He says to Samuel, he says, get your horn and get your oil. I found the king. I know who he is and you're going to come and anoint him. Stop looking at the man that won't be and look at the man that will be. Keep going forward. Then you'll be out of your mourning and then you will be out of your disappointment. How many of you are looking backwards in your life? How many of you are living in disappointment? Oh God, you've done this and you haven't given me that. He's saying, look forward and keep going. You know, one of the things that I have in my life is that uh, I've always been overwhelmed by this idea of being a pastor. And, and now it's been, what, this must be my 11th year or something of being a pastor of some sort. And it got so overwhelming that I had to make a decision in my life whereby I would say, no matter the disappointment, no matter the overwhelming feeling, I must press forward through these moments. And, and I made myself a pact. I would always look forward three years, and I would plan to go forward three years, and at the end of the three years, I would review it. Am I meant to be here? Is this what I'm meant to be doing? Have, has the anointing slightly differed? And I, as God's saying, your time here is, is gone. And every three years, I look at my life and say, okay, I feel like I'm meant to go on another free, and, and unless God stops it halfway through, and I'm going to go. And I have to do that. I have to set my sight in the future rather than set my sight in the past. Otherwise, I get overwhelmed. It's just a tactic I have. But God has been faithful. I get to the end of the three years, and he tells me if I'm meant to go on. And I go on. And I will keep going on until he says otherwise. Keep looking forward. Do not live in disappointment. Do not mourn like Samuel, because you will never, ever see the promises of God. Because God's promises come to those who trust him and who are obedient to him and keep going even when times are tough and even when disappointment comes. If you keep trusting the character of God, then you will find the promises of God. And then we move into the alignments. So we've got disappointment and then we've got alignment. And then we go into verses 6 to 12. And what do we learn in verses 6 to 12? Should we read it again? It says this. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then we go to see that, that God rejects various sons, all the sons of, of Jesse, and then he gets to David and he says this, he says that he's out in the field and he's out tending the sheep and he's the youngest and you know they hadn't even thought about him. And then he says, stand and anoint this man, this man who is pretty much glowing and then he's, he has a good looking appearance and, and, and he's got beautiful eyes. And you see this man, David, appear. And he says, rise and anoint this man. Alignment, alignment. You know, Samuel almost makes the same mistake that Israel made in the first place. He looks at Eliab and he realises that he's the first son, so he's the right one in line. And he looks at him, he realises he's tall and he's strong and he's handsome. Surely this is God's chosen anointed one. We can make some big mistakes when we look at the charismatic person in the church that says, oh, I can teach, I can preach, and I'm good looking, and I'm this, and they're always coming out with all the holy stuff. Don't ever be deceived. 
Because if you look at the outer appearance of anything, not just a person, but if you're buying a car or buying a house or whatever it might be, or trusting a person, if you just go by the outward appearance, you are going to find disappointment in your life sooner or later. You might make some uh, accidental good decisions, but ultimately if you live by the principle of looking by the outward appearance, you will find disappointment sooner or later. Two years ago, uh, I had a knock at my door in my house and this man comes to the door and I smiled and I looked at him and he flashed his armed forces badge and he says, I'm selling stuff for people like me who have been in the army and, uh, and we've, we've got um, post-traumatic stress and we're trying to raise money for us and, and to give us a job. So we're selling stuff. Would you like to buy some stuff? And I just looked at him and my heart melted. I thought, oh, you sweet little man, fought for me. And oh, of course. So I took a few items and I gave him 20 quid. And he shot off quicker than I've seen a Mercedes move, actually. He was on his way, I'll tell you. I never saw him again. And when I got the stuff out, I realized it was all from Poundland. You know, free items, free quid. I've given him 20. I think, this isn't right. So as I looked into it, I'd realized I'd been conned by a con artist. And he probably wasn't even in the armed forces. I must admit, the badge looked a bit odd. And um, so then I had to break it to Rachel, and that is always goes one or two ways. You either get a you are, or you get what I got on this occasion, which was she laughed, and she laughed, and she laughed. Oh, she thought it was hilarious. It was the best 20 quid she'd ever spent out of our bank account, because to see me make such a mistake, it was fantastic for her. I'd been con. I saw this nice little man with a cute little face, a bit weird to say, and uh, should have given it away. Army man, cute face, not sure. And so, I, you know, I'd just been come by it. But, you know, it happened again. Someone comes into this church. His name was Aaron Klen. He claimed to be a Messianic Jew that had been saved and now had no money. It was on the run. And, uh, and uh, he said, I just need 30 quid. I thought, I'll give you 40 because I'm a nice guy. And, uh, oh, lovely, cheap, you know, chap. I really liked him. Went to a meeting with all the pastors in the local area. I said, oh, we had this Messianic Jew. Oh, it's really funny, one of them said. We had a guy just like that. What's his name? Aaron. I said, yes, it was. Another guy around the table. Oh, we had him in our church as well. Went around this table. He'd been to all the churches in the area. Now I'm like, I smell a rat. And I said, uh, just, um, did anyone happen to uh, give him money then, did they? Oh, no, they all said, apart from one, uh, me and, and one other. What an idiot. <laughs> I'd given this man money. All the others had discerned it. Do you know what? I thank God. I thank God that Samuel nearly made the same mistake I did by judging and choosing by the outward appearance. I want you to know that we need to be careful about making life decisions based on what something looks like on the outside. Buying a car, buying a house, choosing a career, choosing a wife, a husband, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, whatever it might be. We've got to be really careful. This is what God said in verse 7. He said, do not consider his appearance or his height. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks beneath the surface. When we are making decisions, we need to look underneath the surface, rather than just looking with our eyes, our physical eyes, and saying, oh, it looks nice. You know, for many years, whenever I've bought a car, I've taken Dennis, one of my dads, with me. And the reason I do that is because I am very likely to buy a car without an engine. Seriously. I look at it and think it's got four wheels and the bodywork looks good. I'll take it. Why not? I've always wanted one of those. And then it won't start perhaps. And I'll look inside and I, one day I'll say to myself, how did I buy a car without an engine? Because you just looked outside. So I take Dennis with me and he looks at it. He looks, he checks there's an engine and he checks that it works. And he looks at it and says, this is a good car. You can buy it. And then I drive it away for a while until it blows up. <laughs> you can't look beyond the surface you've got to go underneath inside you know the Pharisees what did Jesus say to them he said to them you are like whitewashed tombs on the outside you're really clean and pretty and pure but on the inside you are just selling death you've got nothing inside you're rotten and that's what happens when we choose people just or things or any decision by just looking at the outside appearance because our, our hearts deceive us. They really do. When I came into ministry, I had to get a reference uh, from the pastor here to go and train. And yes, yeah, so I do be nice to me if you're going into training, because you do need my reference. And John Bridger, I said to him, John, I need a, a reference to go into training. 
He said, no problem, I'll do that for you. Does a reference, gives it to me. I'm down at Moreland's trying to apply to get in. I thought, I'll just have a sneak peek at his reference. You know, He hadn't hidden it, it was on the form. So I thought, I'll read it. I wasn't going to, I'm going to. I thought this is going to be brilliant. He's going to say how wonderful he is, how great looking he is, and how just wonderful Mike is because he's just wonderful, right? Wonderful. I know you're all sitting there going, yeah, yeah, I get what he would be thinking there. And so I read it, and it just had three words. Character, character, character. That was his reference. Character, character, character. And I'm sitting there going, character, character, character. John, are you, I mean, are you having a moment? John didn't like writing wrong, long references anyway, but this one, I was sitting there thinking, character, he's repeating himself. That's a sign of madness, isn't it? Character, character, character. But the fact is, John knew that my academic history wasn't there. I didn't have one. But he knew me, just as God knows you. And he gave me a reference that said, I can trust this man, and he's reliable. Because John knew me beneath the surface and he knew that anything I lacked academically would not hold me back because my heart was for God. We need to look beneath the surface. 1 Samuel 13, 14, Samuel says to Saul, But now your kingdom will not endure. It could have done, but it's not going to. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart. If you want to start making right decisions that don't lead to disappointment in your life, you need to do what God did here. He looked beneath the surface of a man, he ignored the great looking guys of all the charisma, and he went for the heart. He found a man who loved him. He found a man that had some qualities that you cannot buy. David was not tall. He wasn't a big man. He didn't even fit into Saul's armour, we'll find out later. And you'll find that God chose him. Jesse didn't even invite him to the party because he didn't rate him to be the one the next one. He's just the young kid. He's the little one. You know, he's just tending the sheep. He's the Cinderella of the Bible. Perhaps you're the Cinderella of the church. You think, oh, I can't do anything. And God knows your heart. If you want to do something for God, he'll get you moving. So what did God find in this young, small Cinderella of the Bible? Well, let me tell you three things that are absolutely important in this. The first is this, a heart aligned with God. He had a heart that was after God's heart. You know, David was a man that was looking to please God and to do what God wanted in his life. That's where the blessings was. That's why when he came in, his complexion was so beautiful and his eyes were beautiful. He was like Stephen in Acts uh, when, when he was killed. It says that his, his face was like an angel. This is like David. He had a beautiful face because he had a beautiful heart because your heart will come out in some way for your character. And God saw this heart and he loved his heart and he said, this man is after my heart will do what I want him to do. Will you do what God wants you to do? Or just bits of it? Because that didn't work for Saul. He just missed out one command. Don't kill, go and kill everyone. Oh, I'll just keep a few sheep. No, you obey God to his word. The second thing is integrity. This is what it says in Psalm 78, 71 to 72 about David. It says, from tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands he led them. Two things there. First of all, he brought him from tending the sheep to be the shepherd of Jacob, his inheritance, Israel. He took a shepherd to be a king. And then it says here, he shepherded them with integrity of heart. Have you got integrity of heart? It says here that he had hands that were skillful. He was skillful at it. It means he delighted in it. And here's the thing. Integrity, Chuck Swindle says, is the person you are when no one is looking. If you have integrity, it will show when nobody is looking at you. Integrity can only be seen when no one is looking. Because anyone can put it on, anyone can fake it. God had found a man that wasn't faking it. He was a man in the field looking after the sheep and he was doing it with integrity. He was doing it when no one was looking so that he could get promoted. He was just doing it in the hidden place. 
And then he had humility. This is the third thing. David didn't just tend the sheep. It says here he did it skillfully. He delighted in the lowly job. Do you delight in the lowly jobs? You know, I can tell you that there are many people since my early reign in this church that I've shielded this church from. I've had people that have turned up and they've got all smiles and they come in and say, I've done this in the past church and I've done this and I can do this for you. And very quickly usually, you know, just a week or two in, they might come for two weeks and then they pounce on you and say, I'm this, I'm that, and I can do this. And every time I say, great, then live it and come back to me in a year. We'll get to know you. And often they disappear. And sometimes I'll hear about how they've gone to another church and they've been allowed to do something and they've caused all sorts of trouble. It's because I want to see the heart and I want to see what's beneath the surface and we must be people that make decisions, especially in church. You'll notice that there aren't a, a, a holistic, there ain't loads of numbers of people to stand behind this pulpit, even though we've got gifted people in this church. They'll only get behind here when I've seen their heart and I've seen their integrity and I've seen their humility and we can trust them. That's the only time they'll ever touch this pulpit because this is the most important thing, is that the word of God is sent out in the right way and can be trusted and it's obedient to God. And it's obedient to his whole word, not just parts of his word. The key to making good choices and avoiding dissatisfaction is to see as God sees. Not the surface, but the heart. To get beneath the surface, whether it's choosing a person, trusting a person, using a person, or even buying a car or buying a house, you need to listen to what God is saying and hear you know, if you want to learn to listen to God, we uh, just this week we've had a series, our uh, Walking with God series in midweek, and I've been talking about listening to God. It's not extensive, there's a lot more, but it's a good starting place. And I want to say to you, listen to that. Learn to hear God who speaks all the time. He really does. The other thing is you can go online to YouTube and you pick up talks by Rick Warren on listening to God, and he's brilliant on this. Have a listen to him. But the other thing I can say to you is get a Bible app, like mine, read scripture, read the Bible in a year, and get to know God's character from Genesis to Revelation and realize that he loves you. Because when you come to know God, and when you come to hear God, you will make better decisions in your life and you will not be disappointed when you trust in God because he is faithful. On the surface, on the surface Eliab looked like just a man. Just as all of your decisions might look right on the surface, the right car, the right house, the right girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, whatever it might be, job, it might look right on the surface. But it was in the heart of Samuel that God said, sorry, I've rejected Eliab. He may look good on the surface, but it's not right. But rise and anoint David. You may not always get the decision that you think you should be doing. And the right way may seem right to you, but it will lead to death in the end. The right way is to get to know God's character, to learn how to hear from God as we are talking about midweek and as you can learn more about as I've told you and as you can learn more about as you read the Bible in a year and looking at God's character all the way through. You will come to know his character, come to trust him and you will come to make your choices in alignment with him. And when you choose to use God in alignment and choose your decisions through him, you will find that the disappointments will be less. And when you come to get to the place of disappointments, you will be able to stand up again and move on. Because being in alignment with God will cause you to make right decisions. And finally, assignment. Verse 17, uh, 13 says this. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Making right decisions in alignment with God will bring the power of the Spirit upon your life. All the time you are doing decisions without God, you're not filled with the Spirit because you grieve the Spirit. But here we're told that the Spirit of God comes upon David. It doesn't come upon him for a time. It comes upon him permanently. And you can be filled with the Spirit ongoing and permanently. We learn in the next chapter after this, as we'll see next week, that Saul loses the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes off of him. He leaves him because he makes wrong decisions and he's not in alignment with God. If you align your heart to God, if you start to make decisions based on what God is telling you in that still, small voice in your heart, 
then you will find that you will not be disappointed, you will be filled with the Spirit, and you will see the promises of God. When you follow God, align with God, listen to God and obey God, you will find the promises of God. And I'll end with this last story. There's a man, an Indian man with a very English name, and his name is Stanley, uh, Daniel Stanley. And he was in India, he was a successful banker. And God said to him, I want you to leave your job as a successful banker and I want you to go to London, England, and I want you to lead and to, to shepherd my people who are your people, Tamil people, where you live in India. There are herds of them all over the world, and I want you to go to London, and I want you to start a church and to lead them. He comes to England, and he spends lots of time in London, walking around, talking to people, and everyone thinks he's an idiot, you know, because he doesn't speak the lingo properly, and he's not the same way as everyone else here, and he's trying to share Jesus on the street, and they're just like, the bloke's an idiot. And uh, so he spends his time crying in cafes uh, in London, just crying. And one day he speaks to this guy, and this guy says to him, I'm from where you're from. And he says, I know there's a community in Liverpool that are looking for a pastor. I think you should meet them. So he goes up to Liverpool, he meets them, and he starts this church, and it grows and it grows and it grows. And it goes brilliantly with those people from his community. And then he says, I've got to leave. And they say, why? He says, because God wants me to do something else and I've got to be obedient. He said to come to London and I'm in Liverpool. So this has been great, but I've got to get down there. On the way to London, he plants two other churches. He gets to London in East Ham and he meets some people of his community and the church explodes. Why? Because the Spirit of God worked at his best in him because he remained faithful to God, he remained aligned to God, and even the disappointments of being told he was an idiot in London did not stop him. He got up, he moved on, and he did what God asked him to do, and God's promise came to fulfillment. So the question I ask you today is, are you living in disappointment? Well, God says, get up and move on. Don't live in the past, don't romanticize about the past, Keep going, and I will show you my promises. Keep your heart right. Keep it aligned with me. Stay humble. Have integrity. And follow my heart. You will see my promises fulfilled. Church, you are the most powerful people on the earth. But for his glory, stay aligned with him. God bless you.